Jessica, a senior at Bullet Central, was found in the woods, strangled to death just seven miles from her home. That was in 1999. Jessica Dishon's murder remains unsolved. Anyone with information is urged to call the Bullet County Sheriff's Department. Every night I work, I go out there and hand this Jessica's cross and pray for her to help us solve this case. I want to find out who killed my daughter. 17-year-old Jessica Dishon is missing, and all that's left behind at the scene is her mobile phone, her purse, her rucksack, and one of her shoes. Who abducted and killed Jessica Dishon? Unfortunately, the world would have to wait 15 years for her case to be solved due to issues such as police misconduct, contamination of evidence, and false accusations. Jessica Dishon was born on the 2nd of May, 1982, to her parents Edna and Michael Dishon. She lived in the small town of Shepherdsville in Kentucky, a farming town 20 miles from Louisville. Here she lived with her parents and her two younger brothers, Mike Jr., who they nicknamed Bubby, and Chris. Jessica was a senior at Bullet Central High School and a great student with good grades. She was described by friends and family as a very responsible girl with dreams of becoming an accountant and plans to one day leave Shepherdsville. Her life was going well and she was becoming increasingly independent. She had just bought herself a new car and supposedly had a new boyfriend, so her life was full of possibilities and happiness. However, she was also incredibly close with her family, so when she disappeared, they were completely heartbroken. On the 10th of September 1999, a few months after Jessica's 17th birthday, Jessica's mum Edna arrived home around 1pm. She spotted Jessica's new red Pontiac car in the driveway and Edna immediately thought that this was strange. Jessica would have taken her car to get to school, where she would have had class until 2.30pm. Edna walked towards the car and looked inside to see if Jessica was there but there was no sign of her. Immediately, Edna called her husband and Jessica's father, Michael, who was also confused as he expected Jessica to be at school. By this point, Edna was extremely worried and decided to take a closer look inside Jessica's car. Inside the vehicle, she found Jessica's purse, her rucksack, and only one of her shoes, along with her mobile phone which was sitting on the passenger seat. She noticed the keys to the car were on the floor, so she tried to start the vehicle to see if it was working. Maybe the car had stopped working and Jessica had gone to school another way, but no, the car was working absolutely fine. Edna then called Jessica's school, but at Central High School, and alarmingly they confirmed that Jessica had never arrived at school that day. Jessica's father Michael immediately rushed back to the house to help Edna, and he did another check of the car. As he picked up the phone, he saw the numbers 9 and 1 had been typed into the phone. It was obvious that Jessica was trying to ring 911, but something or someone had interrupted her. Frantically, Edna and Michael started calling everyone they knew to see if anyone had any information on Jessica's whereabouts, but no one had seen her. Their worst fears were confirmed and they knew that something was wrong. That same day around 5pm, Jessica's parents went to the sheriff's department to report Jessica missing. When they got there, only one rookie deputy called David Greenwell believed that there may have been something seriously wrong with Jessica and that foul play may have been involved. Greenwell's senior detectives, however, didn't take Edna and Michael seriously. Instead, they believed that Jessica was a runaway and that she would turn up soon enough. David Greenwell, the only detective who believed something was seriously wrong, went to the crime scene the very next day. It was clear to him that this was not a runaway, as was believed by his superiors. What teenager leaves everything important to her behind in her car? From the beginning, Jessica's family believed she had been kidnapped. They said Jessica would never have just left her family. Greenwell did his best to take pictures and cover the crime scene, as no one was willing to help him and take the case seriously. But as a young rookie detective, he made significant mistakes throughout his investigations. For example, the crime scene quickly became contaminated, as he failed to wear gloves and he let members of the public and even journalists access the crime scene. By this point, as the local law enforcement was barely helping, Jessica's family and the local community stepped up. They set up civilian searches and would go out and search for Jessica. Michael Dishon said this was so tough on the family, but they wanted to do it as the police were not helping and they had to find their daughter. Searching for Jessica was so difficult. 
Michael even recalls one instance when they were searching for Jessica, where his brother, Stanley Dishon, Jessica's uncle, got so sick and vomited during the search, so they had to stop it and take him home. Stanley also mentioned that if a person were to kill someone in this town, they would most likely throw the body in the river bottoms. Therefore, this is where they would focus their search for Jessica. The river bottoms were a scary place, where if anything terrible were to happen in Bullet Town, this is where it was said to occur. A few days later, Jessica's brother Chris came running into the house, saying that he thought he had heard Jessica outside screaming for help. Michael immediately grabbed his gun and ran outside. When Stanley saw his brother running outside frantically, he joined him, and they searched the surrounding areas. Up on the hill they saw a fire. When they approached the fire, they saw one of their neighbours, David Bucky Brooks, burning clothes in a barrel. Michael was immediately suspicious of this, so he asked if he could search Bucky's property as part of his civilian search, to which Bucky said no. Michael then called the police to tell them what he had seen, and to ask them to look into this. Bucky, however, also would not allow law enforcement to search his property, so they had to go and get a warrant. When the police obtained a warrant for Bucky's property, a scent dog led them to a farming building, where a pair of work gloves were found under a cushion. These gloves had a strange smell on them. The police also searched the work van that Bucky drove, and a rope was found. Though things may have seemed suspicious at this point, they didn't have enough evidence to arrest Bucky. Over time, the Dishon family got so frustrated with the police not doing enough, that they decided to get the FBI involved. Once the FBI got involved, local law enforcement started to take the case more seriously. An $18,000 reward was put up for any information which would lead to the finding of Jessica, or capture of her abductor. The police finally started their official investigation by looking at Jessica's car. However, Jessica's car had been sitting in her family drive since her disappearance, and all the evidence from around and inside the vehicle had unfortunately been compromised. Too many people had touched the car. Family members, friends, volunteers, and even the media had been in contact with the vehicle. This illustrated the level of police misconduct that tainted this investigation. They did, however, notice a sign of a struggle near the car's driver's side door. This was when they started to believe that Jessica had indeed been abducted. Days after her disappearance, the FBI concluded that Jessica had likely been abducted by someone she knew. The FBI built the following scenario based on the available evidence. They believed Jessica was most likely trying to call 911 when she was pulled out of her car, losing her shoe in the struggle, breaking her seat, and dropping her keys to the car floor. When the FBI rechecked Bucky Brooks' farm, they found a small printed school photo of Jessica on the property. By this point, Bucky Brooks was looking incredibly suspicious, but without a body or more physical evidence to link him to the disappearance, they couldn't arrest him. On the 27th of September 1999, 17 days after Jessica disappeared, a bus driver called Karen Hobbs was driving her usual route through the river bottoms. During her drive, she spotted something strange resting up against a tree. She immediately called 911, saying she had just seen a body in the ravine. When the police got to the scene, they found the body of a young woman just off a dirt road in a heavily wooded area along the Salt River, seven miles from the Dishon home. The body was found sitting up against a tree, partially clothed, and a rope with traces of silver, red, and grey paint was found around her leg. The coroner believed the rope found around her leg had been used to move the body from one spot to another, as about 15 feet away, the police found some hair and body fluids. The body was so badly decomposed by this point that she was completely unrecognisable. The sheriff's department went to the Dishon household to inform them that a body had been found. On hearing this, Edna Dishon responded to the sheriff, Are you now going to say to me that she's just a runaway? Jessica's dad, Michael, refused to go and identify the body. He could not face seeing his daughter like that. Edna, however, agreed to go, and sadly, the young woman was indeed confirmed to be Jessica Dishon. She was identified by her tattoo, class ring, necklace, and later on, dental records. After Jessica's body was found, her parents thanked the community and everyone who had helped, particularly during the searches. They acknowledged the outpouring of love and support they had received from the community during this incredibly difficult time. Michael Dishon said he'll always remember his daughter Jessica as a sweet, innocent girl. The autopsy found that Jessica was likely killed around three days after she was abducted. 
It was also found that Jessica had suffered blunt force trauma to her face and that her cause of death was strangulation. They also believed that Jessica had been sexually assaulted based on how her clothes were found. However, when her clothes were tested, the forensics couldn't find definite proof that she had been sexually assaulted. By this point, the Dishon's neighbour, David Bucky Brooks, was the main suspect. Bucky was 40 years old and worked on his family farm. When the police questioned Bucky, he said he had seen Jessica walking in the direction of her school the day of her disappearance. He however later changed his story and said he had been in bed all morning with his wife, which she later denied. What was even more suspicious was that several witnesses mentioned they had seen Bucky's van on the road that Jessica was eventually found on days leading up to her discovery. As Bucky kept changing his story, the FBI gave him a series of polygraph tests where he failed four out of six of them, with the remaining two coming out as inconclusive. Sixteen months after the disappearance of Jessica Dishon, David Bucky Brooks was charged with capital murder. David Bucky Brooks' trial started in January 2003, and prosecutors were going to seek the death penalty. At this point, the Dishon family were pleased that the police had found someone responsible for Jessica's murder and that she would finally be getting some justice. The trial, however, did not go well. Clearly, the local law enforcement had their eyes solely on Bucky and handled the whole case exceptionally poorly. They had contaminated evidence, had not taken the case seriously in the first 48 hours and had no physical evidence or a confession from Bucky Brooks. The case truly fell apart during Bucky Brooks' trial in 2003, when it ended in a mistrial. This was because Detective Charlie Mann had made a statement on the stand about the failed polygraph test, which was not allowed to be mentioned, as polygraph tests are inadmissible in court due to their unreliability and scientific inaccuracy. And so, charges against Bucky Brooks were dropped in September 2003, when prosecutors said they didn't have enough evidence to get a conviction. This is when Jessica's case would go cold for 15 years. Jessica Dishon's murder remains unsolved. Anyone with information is urged to call the Bullock County Sheriff's Department. During this time, Edna and Michael sadly went their separate ways. The murder of their daughter and the mistrial had put too much of a strain on their marriage and they couldn't handle the grief. But then one day, a new suspect would emerge. Detective Lynn Hunt, a detective who worked on cold cases in Shepherdsville, Kentucky, would receive a call from her old colleague asking her to reopen the case. When Lynn started to look into the case, she realised how badly handled it was. There was barely any evidence and everything was just horribly organised so she decided to start from the beginning. Lynn visited the Dishon household, where Michael still lived, and she investigated Jessica's room. Michael had left Jessica's room completely untouched, and it was in exactly the same state as it had been 15 years ago. He had not touched it since the day of Jessica's kidnapping, and it remained completely unchanged. In Lynn's investigation, she also found Bucky's mental examination. She realised that Bucky's IQ was only 61, and that he should not have been given a polygraph test. Bucky's IQ was so low that he had legally been considered to have a mental disability, and he wouldn't have understood the questions being asked, so he was most likely taken advantage of by law enforcement, and this is likely why he changed his story multiple times. He probably wasn't able to fully understand what was happening and what the questions he was being asked meant. Yeah, we're getting ready to start our life over again. I didn't know what world to think was going on. I just didn't know what to do or nothing. Brooks always maintained his innocence. His wife, Irene, remained by his side. From day one, Mr. Spanar and uh, Vince Eustace, Neil Alioto, sat at this very same table and looked at me and said, we're going to bring him home. In June 2013, Detective Lynn interviewed an inmate who alleged that they knew someone who had claimed to have murdered Jessica. The inmate had said he had heard that the culprit had kidnapped Jessica and held her hostage for a few days at an abandoned barn. Here, the culprit had tortured and eventually strangled her and taken her life. He then proceeded to mutilate her to make it look like it had been a drug deal gone wrong. He then had moved her body because he had felt bad and wanted her to be found. Detective Lynn Hunt and her colleagues believed the inmate as he knew too many specific points of the investigation and evidence which only the killer would have known. The information provided by the inmate matched Jessica's autopsy report and was further collaborated by another inmate who came forward with the same name and details of the crime. Tell me about how he killed her. He got an argument with her in her backyard, wherever they lived at, 
and he started chuckling early, and he went in the house and got a scar. And he said, uh, after she did, uh, had died, he knew she was dead. Then he started cutting her up. So how did he get her, get her around? He, the best he could as it was, and he had to uh, uh, dismember her. Is what he told me. Then he left her. He ended up leaving her in, in the woods by the road, by the river. The inmates said that the killer was none other than Stanley Dishon, Jessica's uncle. This was the Stanley who had done interviews with her family. The Stanley who had come over to help his brother Michael to search for Jessica. The Stanley who had thrown up during a civilian search, all to find out that he had pretended to be sick, as they were only half a mile away from where Jessica was found, so he was trying to distract the search party. The two inmates said Stanley killed Jessica because she told him she would no longer keep his secret, strangling her with a scarf. His secret was that he had been abusing Jessica for years in the family home while he was living there. He had also gotten angry that morning when he discovered that Jessica had a boyfriend. By this point, Stanley Dishon was already in prison for assaulting other minors. He was serving a 10-year sentence for first-degree sodomy when he was indicted in August 2013 on unrelated sexual abuse and sodomy charges dating back to 1982. Police said that the victim was a girl less than 12 years old. To get more evidence to prove further that Stanley had killed Jessica, Detective Lynn Hunt and Jessica's brother went to the area where Jessica was found. They entered the woods and found the abandoned barn on Greenwell Ford Road. When they went inside, it was so dirty and grim, and under all the rubbish and dirt, they found a bedsheet buried deep. There lay what appeared to be a sheet that matched her comforter that was tattered and deteriorated, and he was behind me and I said, that looks an awful lot like her sheet or her sheets on the bed. And he goes, Lynn, I, you know, I don't know, her room's still the same. As Michael had left Jessica's room completely untouched since her disappearance, they managed to match the bed sheet with the bedding that was still on Jessica's bed. Pulled the comforter back and there's no fitted sheet on the bed. There's no comforter. When the police interviewed Stanley Dishon, he refused to confess. The police wanted more to convict him. They discovered that Stanley had a history of abusing young girls, with many of the victims being children of his family members. Stanley would be welcomed into his relatives' homes, given a place to live, and he would repay them by abusing the young children. Three of these young victims, now adults, agreed to testify against Stanley, with some giving impact statements during his sentencing. At trial, Stanley Dishon took an Alford plea for manslaughter and other sex crimes. By taking an Alford plea, Stanley was not admitting guilt to crimes, but rather admitted that the evidence provided in court would be enough to convict him. He still maintained his innocence. At the trial, both of Jessica's parents gave statements confronting Stanley. Michael broke down as Stanley stared right at him, crying about how he had opened his home to his brother and found him a job only for them to be repaid in this way. Well, it turned out. 17 years of my life away from me. When he killed my daughter. And I said from the day one, when the man was called to kill my daughter, I was seeing him hang. And that's what I meant. I want to know why I did it. Edna testified that there was a hole in her heart that would never be filled, and that they were robbed of a life that should have never been taken. Well, for one thing, not only my daughter, but any chance of having grandchildren, I feel like I'm deprived of any grandchildren that she could have gave me. And there's a hole in my heart that can never be filled. In March 2015, 56-year-old Stanley Dishon was sentenced to 20 years for manslaughter and other sex crimes. Jessica's parents were disappointed in the sentencing as they had been hoping for the death penalty. Stanley continues to contact the Dishon family from jail, maintaining his innocence. I am an innocent man. I did not kill Jessica Don Dishon. His brother Michael refuses to accept Stanley's reasonings, maintaining that the plea deal he had accepted indicates he is just lying. Why else would Stanley take a plea deal if he knew he was innocent? They're not family. You can't be family to do something like that. He's a monster. It was found that on the morning of the 10th of September 1999, Stanley Dishon had gone over to his brother Michael's house after everyone had left and waited for Jessica to come out of the house. As she was going towards her car to go to school, Stanley confronted her about her new boyfriend. 
By this point, he had been sexually assaulting and abusing his niece for years. And when he had found out she had a new boyfriend, he was furious. Detective Lynn Hunt further indicated at Stanley's sentencing hearing that Jessica was thinking of confiding in her new boyfriend the abuse she was experiencing at the hands of her uncle. She wanted to tell a boyfriend that she was currently seeing uh, about the ongoing sexual abuse and rape of her uncle. At that time, he decided to go ahead and kill her. Stanley had pulled her out of her car while she was trying to dial 911. He had knocked off her shoe and Jessica threatened to tell everyone what he had done to her when she was little. This just made Stanley even madder and when she ran back into the house to her room, Stanley chased after her. They got into a fight and Stanley knocked Jessica out, breaking her jaw in the process. He then wrapped her up in her bedsheet, remade her bed to hide the uncovered mattress and took her to the barn where he held her for three days. Here, he sexually abused her and tortured her, cut off her fingers and then strangled her. We know that she drove over there that morning. We have evidence that she drove over there that morning. He drove to the school. She wasn't there. Oh, no. He drove to the house. You had been having sex with her. Oh, no. She was going to tell on you. Oh no. You and she gotten into an argument. No. Mm -hmm. Then you choked her. No. And then you took her. Mm -hmm. And you dumped her in the river bottoms. Oh no. Every bit of that's a lie. You're you're cooked. I don't care what you got. Right. I did not do anything to harm my niece. Right now it's the difference between you getting the needle and you getting life. Honestly, this case breaks my heart. Stanley Dishon completely broke his whole family and abused and hurt those who were supposed to be closest to him, his family. Stanley Dishon will have to serve 85% of his 20 year sentence before he is eligible for parole. If you ask me, this is nowhere near long enough. He should be locked up and spend the rest of his life in jail after he took Jessica's life in such a cruel and vicious way. Not only did Stanley Dishon ruin the lives of Edna, Michael and Jessica's brothers, but also Bucky Brooks. He suffered for years. He was falsely accused of a crime he didn't commit and was a product of horrible police misconduct. The false accusations probably affected him until his death in 2021, where he passed away of cardiac issues. David Bucky Brooks died from cardiac arrest yesterday at his home. He told his family he wasn't feeling well and died in his sleep. My heart goes out to Edna, Mike and her brothers. It took 15 years to find Jessica's killer, but finally, justice is served.